Welcome everyone to Zoom Into Books this afternoon. We have actress and award-winning author Dreama Denver with guest interviewer Burke Allen today. Burke, take it away. Hey, thank you so much for being here for our Big Time Talker podcast. We're everywhere now, Apple, iTunes, Spotify, Blog Talk Radio Network, wherever you can subscribe to podcasts, you'll find us there. Thanks to our friends at speakermatch.com, our show sponsor, world's largest online virtual speakers bureau. And we're also simulcasting on the Zoom Into Books video platform with our friends at Headline Books, the publisher of Four Bears in a Box, Back to the Beach. The author is my pal. She's an actress, a writer, a radio station owner. Ho, ho, ho. And uh, <laughs> personality, Dream of Denver who was married for, gosh, three decades to, to Bob Denver, who played Gilligan on Gilligan's Island. Dream of Denver is here and joins us. And congratulations, you now have a new book that is an award winner. How about that? Can you believe that? Just a couple of days ago, right when it was ready to come out, it got a reader's favorite, which is, you know, kind of a big deal. That's what you want to get. The reader's loving it. So, yeah, it's really exciting. You are, in fact, kind of a big deal, Dream in Denver. Oh, would you stop? Not really. <laughs> My husband was a big deal, and I represent that big deal, you know? Your husband, of course, Bob Denver, who played uh, uh, Gilligan on Gilligan's Island. And you guys actually got to do a Gilligan's Island movie together. We did. We With did the, Globetrotters. the Harlem Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island. This was uh, an Academy Award winner, as I recall, back in the 80s. Is that <laughs> it's the sure Academy was. Award for Best okay, Basketball I'm... Movie <laughs> on a Desert Island goes to? I'm going to say this out loud. Yes. About five years after we did that, maybe six years, after we did that uh, TV movie, we were living in Vegas and uh, taking care of our son. Now, this is you and Bob, not you and the Globetrotters. No, 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 me and Bob. Okay, anyway, it, yes. we were living in Vegas. He was in the TV room or the family room, you know, switching channels. And suddenly I hear him yell, honey, come here, come here. You're not going to believe what's on. So I go running in. And <laughs> of course, it's the heart on Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island. The first time we had actually seen it, except for the, the viewing they had for the cast and the crew and everything. Uh -huh. And so we're sitting there watching it going like, okay, it's one of those cult kind of things. <laughs> you know? That's what you were hoping for, at least, huh? <laughs> it, would, it was so much fun to do. The Globetrotters were so awesome. I mean, I got to play basketball with the original Globetrotters. How many what people can that? say that? You what know? that? Now, you, when you did that movie, uh, your basketball skills would have been at what level, would you say? Minus two. Okay. So... Yeah. Is it true that the Globetrotters were not supposed to actually even be in that thing? They were like a last-minute substitution? Kind of, yes. Um, now, I may not have all the details of the story, but it was originally supposed to be the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders on Gilligan's Island. And uh, I don't know, I don't remember if I ever knew exactly what happened to change all of that, but that changed, and it became the Harlem Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island. And the entire script of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's a difference, right? Cheerleaders to Globe Charters. But yes. at any rate, the whole premise of that movie revolved around Jim Backus. And the whole thing had been, been written around the character, Thurston Howell. And of course, by the time they were ready to film, uh, I started to say Thurston, Jim was very, very ill and uh, couldn't do it. So they brought in David Ruprecht to play Thurston Howell the fourth, which nobody knew existed. The house didn't have any children as far as we all knew, but suddenly they had a son and he came in and did a brilliant job of not only uh, mimicking Thurston Howell the third, you know, he was, he was so much like Jim, but he came in at the last minute. It was just one of those things where, you know, everything kind of changed on the fly. And so uh, it was, you know, the, the Globetrotters weren't supposed to do that much acting, but ended up doing a lot of acting. 
those of us who were actors. <laughs> well, I think you're being a little liberal with that, that they what? were doing a lot of acting. I think you were being a little, little uh, liberal with that. Now, I love those guys. They were so awesome. I would never besmirch their acting talent, ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, but those of us who were actors ended up having to play basketball with the Globetrotters. So um, we weren't any good at that. So, you know, it was like, and the thing I remember most, are you ready? And if you know what's going to happen when we're playing basketball with them, I'm like in the center and we weren't playing. We're just, the girls are just running around flailing, you know, <laughs> it was really funny. But the Globetrotters were doing their thing. And yeah. I was sort of in the middle of the screen and I go to catch the ball and it broke my nail. And I could, I'm a girl. I could literally on screen see my nails shatter. <laughs> <laughs> what? You, know, you never heard that story, did you? I was not aware of the broken <laughs> nail. This must have been traumatic for you. It was reason. very traumatic. <laughs> not really, but it was, uh, it was so much fun. I really understood during the filming of that why they were called ambassadors you know, to the world, really, for this country. They were the most awesome. And Scatman Crothers, I mean, come on, you know, he was in there. And I watched uh, your interview last week with Nate, and I was so, um, so excited to see him. He is looking good. Nate Branch, former Harlem Globetrotter, who, yes. I don't know if you, you caught this or not, but there was a Harlem Globetrotter Saturday morning cartoon, and Scatman Crothers was the voice of Globetrotter Nate Branch in the Saturday morning cartoon. Oh, now see, I did not know that? that. I never saw that. I have a, uh, you know, Bob and I bought for Colin when he was little, really little, maybe five or six. Uh, we bought the Harlem Globetrotter pinball machine. So I have that downstairs right next to the Gilligan's Island pinball machine. So I've got the Harlem Globetrotters pinball and you know, we love those guys. They were just so great to work with, so much fun. And it was a great cast. We had Martin Landau and Barbara Bain. Who, who actually did were... win an Academy Award. Not for that movie, but no, Martin but Landau right... did win. No, but the funny thing is he won an Academy Award right after. It was like, it was hilarious. I forget what he won it for, but it was so hilarious to know him and to see him playing the character he played on Harlem Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island. And then turn around the next year and watch him at the Academy Awards accepting an Oscar. That was like, that was pretty, you know, that was pretty impressive. I got to tell you. Dream of Denver is our guest today on the Big Time Talker podcast and Zoom into books. Dream of, do you have a copy of your brand new award winning book there that you can hold up so everybody can see it? Well, of Look course I do. Would we Look expect I wouldn't? Four there. bears in a box go back to the beach. And, and would they that do. beach be the Gilligan's Island Beach? It would be. Anybody who has seen the first book or read the first book to their children or grandchildren or little brother or sister uh, knows that when their magic box became a hot air balloon, they flew over this island. And when they looked down, there was a man in a red shirt and a white hat waving back to them. And so... And back to the beach, they decide after hibernation all winter long, they're just dying for an adventure. And they decide they're gonna go back to the beach and look for the man with the red shirt and the white hat. And something about him drew them to him. And they, they just felt like it was somebody they wanted to get to know better. So they do, they go back. And the thing that's really fun and I think is so appropriate today is, um, when they get there, they meet all these different creatures that are absolutely nothing like them. They meet King Crab, who is sort of the leader um, on the island of, of all the creatures. And, and they meet Lubby Turtle, who um, is sort of, well, not sort of, she is kind of based on Mrs. Lovey Howell. Howell. Yeah, Lovey yeah. Howell. She's got the lorgnettes and everything. And um, it really is about, you know, meeting people who are totally different, celebrating those differences, knowing that we're all new, unique in our own special way, and, um, and celebrating that fact and becoming fast friends, which is 
what happens, but I'm not going to tell you if they find the man in the red shirt, who they call, they find out from King Crab that his name is Giggling. 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 Yes. I like How it. appropriate is that? <laughs> when, when Bob used to do personal appearances and little children, I'm talking, you know, three, four years old, when the parents would bring them up to meet him, you know, when you're that age, wrapping your tongue around different sounds is difficult. And they couldn't say Gil again. They couldn't get that out. So they always called him, and it happened often, they called him Giggling, which Bob and I <laughs> thought was just, we thought it was so perfect. So when I went to write this character in the book, I was like, you know, Bob would get a kick out of that. He would think that was pretty awesome. Also, the title of the book, um, Back to the Beach, is the title of a movie that Bob did. Oh, goodness gracious, back in the, I guess that was back in the 80s. Yeah, it was like the mid 80s uh, with uh, Frankie and Annette and Pee Wee Herman and all these, you know, great fun people got two thumbs up from Siskel and Ebert back in the day, which surprised Bob no end. But it was really a fun visit back to those days of all the beach movies, you know. And so the title just seemed perfect. And again, it was it was a nod to Bob and his career, the title of the book. So. The book is Four Bears in a Box, Back to the Beach. The author is Dream of Denver. It's available to the general public September 13th. But today, if you're watching today during our special Zoom into Books live broadcast, you can get an advanced autographed copy by going to bobdenver.com, bobdenver.com. If there is a Gilligan's Island fan in your family, or if you're a Gilligan's Island fan and you got kids or grandkids, this is the perfect gift for bears in a box back to the beach from Dream of Denver. Folks are chiming in with, with hellos uh, from Greg, who says, congratulations, Dreama. You're an amazing advocate for kids and families. Aww. Kathy Lambert says she is anxious to read the book. Stacy, so excited to share this book with students. And uh, remember, if you order your copy today at bobdenver.com, bobdenver.com, you get an advanced autographed copy from the author, Dreama Denver. Now, Gilligan's Island fans are way into their thing. I learned that <laughs> they're almost like Star Trek fans. They, they analyze every little thing. And I'm not yeah. sure that you will be able to even chime in on this, but I've got to ask you because earlier this morning, your publisher, Headline Books, uh, posted on Facebook, got over 12,000 comments so I want to address this, this question. The comment was that the, the boat, the SS Minnow, Gilligan's Island, was a 1964 wheeler with a cruising speed of 12 knots, which means they could never have traveled more than 41 and a half miles. So was that, in fact, the actual Minnow, and how did this all happen? I have no idea. I really, I saw that post. And I wanted to come back with something funny, uh, but I couldn't think of anything because I'm not that well versed in in those things. In Gilligan's Island lore, you don't know your oh, no, lore. Gilligan's not Island not that lore. lore. That lore I'd never heard before. So, ooh, that rhymed. But that lore I'd never heard before. So, um, the last I heard about the boat, I have no idea about the wheeler part or any of that. But the last I heard about it. And I think Dawn went there, if I'm not mis as I know she did. Dawn somebody Wells, in Canada. Dawn Wells, right. Um, somebody in Canada had bought the original minnow, or one of the original minnows. I'm sure there was more than one, and had restored it. But I don't know if it was a wheeler. I don't know how fast it could go. I don't know anything about anything. In that regard, so three-hour tour thing is a little suspect. Well, no, I mean, gosh, suspending belief—you know—you just roll with it. Look, you have to go with the fact that the howls for a three-hour tour had clothes for every single occasion. Everything that came up on the island, they were dressed appropriate appropriately. Um, Don Wells had different clothing. You know, you just have to. The only people who had the same clothes were the men were 
the professor Gilligan and the skipper. And so you had to suspend belief on a lot of things on that show, but that's okay. You know, With they the, did have somebody once though. Oh gosh, I won't tell the story exactly right, I'm sure. But they did have somebody once wrote Sherwood, like a, a commander in the Navy or something. How'd that story go? Or maybe they went to CBS at the time or wrote CBS at the time and said that they were getting letters over and over and over in the military about the fact that there were seven people stranded on the island in a, an island in the South Pacific and couldn't somebody go and rescue these people? Couldn't the Navy send somebody to get them? <laughs> and it just blew Sherwood away because you know, they, people look at things and they just take them seriously, I guess. But they got a lot of mail about that. How many seasons was that show on? Was it three seasons? Is that right? Three. Three. How, how many episodes? You know? episodes. 98. Many? 98. 98. Back in those days, they did, unlike, certainly unlike these days, but unlike even more recent days, they did like 32 or 33 episodes a season. And there were Gilligan's Island Saturday morning cartoons too, right? I remember that from when I was a kid. There, yeah, there was uh, the Adventures, the Adventures of Gilligan's Island, I think was one. And then the one I was around for uh, was Gilligan's Planet. I got to go to the studios and watch them draw Bob's character, and I got to sit in the booth with them when they were when the actors were voicing um, the characters for for that cartoon. So yeah, that was fun. And oh, Bob loved the whole thing about watching them draw him and and seeing how they put it together. You know, when they go like with the pages and the character moves and all that. He was just so fascinated by all that. So was I, it was pretty. And that was the one where Gilligan's Planet, Dawn Wells did not only Mary Ann, she also did the ginger character in that cartoon. A lot of people don't know that. I did not know that. See, I've See, learned something new. I was determined to teach you something new today. <laughs> she double dipped. Very good. Um, did did Bob ever, uh, did he ever grouse about being typecast? Because he was not only, you know, in one iconic TV show, but for an earlier generation, he had a starring role in a whole other iconic TV show, uh, right. you know, 10 years before that, when he was in Dobie Gillis as the beatnik Mater Krebs. So, did he ever, you know, in a quiet moment when you guys are at home, did he, did he gripe and complain that he was typecast as Gilligan or, or Krebs? Not by, no, not by the time I met him. Now, I think when Gilligan's Island went off the air, he was only like 33 years old, maybe 32 even, but 33 for sure. And, and he was a young actor and he wanted to stretch, as they say, and do other parts and all of that kind of thing. And he didn't really, um, he was so typecast as that character that by the time I met him all those years and certainly all the time I was married to him, those are the parts he, he was offered, you know, something that was like Gilligan, Gilligan-ish, you know, that's what they wanted him to do. And by the time I met him though, he was 42 years old and really had come to understand the impact the unbelievable impact of this little show that they never thought would, you know, last past maybe the first season, the impact that it had on people, you know, the, the amazing thing back when it was all snail mail before you, you know, had email and all that, Bob would get long handwritten letters from uh, fans, talk, adults now talking about when they were children and how Gilligan's Island had been an escape for them. Uh, they lived in a, an abusive household. Their father drank too much. Their mother drank too much. Their parents were absent. And that was their little safe space, was especially when it started rerunning after school and right. reran for like six hours a day, you know, just one right after the other. He started getting a lot of those letters. And of course, when the, when the internet started and email became a thing, got even more of those letters. And he suddenly, Again, by the time I knew him, he was he really had an understanding of what this meant. It was a, a moment in time when the world was a simpler place in a lot of ways, you know, and 
after 911, the mail was unbelievable online because people wanted that nostalgia. They wanted to go back to when things weren't scary and things were simpler and all that kind of thing. So he really came to embrace it. I think in the very beginning, before I was around, when uh, he had a hard time getting, you know, the acting jobs maybe that he wanted to get, you know, I think it was frustrating then. But by the time I knew him, he, he had made friends with it and kind of accepted it as the way it was. And that wasn't a bad thing. How many people, how many actors, especially in those days, had two famous characters that were, Maynard G. Krebs was one of the top 50 characters in television, according to TV Guide. And Gilligan's Island was one of the, uh, according to, I think it was Entertainment. Team Weekly chose it as one of the top 100 series of all time. I mean, he did two, you know, really powerful and great series. I personally loved Dobie Gillis. That was my, I love Maynard. That was my favorite. But, um, but he was, he was good with it. He really was. Dream of Denver is our guest today. We're talking about our brand new book, Four Bears in a Box, Back to the Beach. And if you're watching right now, you can get it. An advanced copy. It's not even on sale yet. It goes on sale September 13th. But for folks who are watching today, it's our, our friends and family and fans, uh, an autographed copy at bobdenver.com while supplies last. If she gets to the bottom of the box, then they're gone till the on sale date. So go to bobdenver.com and order an autographed copy today. Do you have any insight or did, did Bob have any insight into what it was that made uh, Gilligan's Island have the staying power that it, it does. I mean, there were a lot of of iconic TV shows, and I know you and I have talked about back in the day. There were three networks, and so if you were on one of those shows and it was a hit, everybody saw it or at least were aware of you. Right. But not all of those shows have a shelf life like Gilligan's Island does. I mean, Gilligan's Island is still on TV today, and all those episodes are on the streaming services today. So. Did he have a thought as to why that is? Or do you have a thought on why the silly little show about the castaways has such a shelf life? <laughs> yes, actually, he did have a thought and a very good one, I think. Um, first of all, I'll say that, you know, there, there are characters in that show to represent, you know, a lot of different economic levels in life and a lot of right. different kind of lifestyles. So, and of course, that was back in in the early days of television. So it doesn't represent everything that we want represented today. But back in those days, it really covered, um, I think quite a bit. But Bob always said, and I think this was so spot on, when you think of any show from the early 60s, like Dobie Gillis was 59 to 63, and then Gilligan picked up in 63 to 67, or 64, I guess it would be to 67. And when you think of any show, Father Knows Best, The Donna Reed Show, all the things that I grew up watching and loving, you can place them in a particular time period. They're driving the old cars. They've got the old rotary phones. They've got Gilligan's Island. You can't do that. You could take that show and put it on the air right now, exactly the way it is, brand spanking new, nobody know anything about it. And it would look like a current show. Right. Because there's nothing to date it. It it's is timeless nothing. in that way. You're right. It, and it, it really was timeless. And that's what Bob thought was part of the, you know, part of the charm of the show was that that you could tune in kids, you know, let's say in the 70s after it had been off the air for 10 years, off the current primetime schedule for 10 years, and then it was rerunning after school to those kids. It was brand new and it wasn't black and white. It didn't look old fashioned. It was beautiful to look at with all the landscaping and the greenery that that those people worked on on the set on the back lot of CBS. And, you know, it just was, um, it was sort of the dream. I mean, who doesn't want, want to get lost on a desert island and kind of get away from the world? I think we've all wanted that the last few years, a time or two. So, you know, that's what he thought, the timelessness, because you can't, you can't, pin it down to any, you can't look at it and go, ah, that was definitely the early 60s. You'd never know that. Except for the one episode with the mosquitoes. Do you remember that episode? Tell me. 
It was the mosquitoes. Oh, bam, the mosquitoes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the mosquitoes landed on the island some way, somehow. Yes. And, um, and they were definitely a takeoff <laughs> on the Beatles. Right, that's right. So with remember. the long hair and the, the drums and all that kind of stuff. So uh, that one, yes, you could put that. That one is dated, but all the others, you know. Folks are chiming in with questions and they just want to say hello. There's Billy watching from down at Hilton Head Island, in quotes. Um, He's on his oh. own island and uh, oh. enjoying the conversation today. The book is Four Bears in a Box, Back to the Beach. The author is Dream of Denver. It is an award winner and uh, reader's favorite loves it. You'll love it too. If you've got kids, grandkids, pick up an autographed copy now before it goes on sale to everybody else on the 13th. You can get it now at uh, BobDenver.com. Lots of great Gilligan's Island trivia and stuff on there. Uh, there's a question that came in and I'll sort of paraphrase. It was a long question, but the first season of Gilligan's Island, which I believe was black and white, right? The second two were in color in the first season in the opening credits, they don't mention the professor or Mary Ann. And the, the question is, and I don't know if you even know if this is true or not, but, but it says on the internet and you know, if it's on the internet, it has to be true. Oh it, yes, for sure. It says on the internet that that your husband, the Bob Denver, lobbied for the professor Marianne to be included as full cast members and to get mentions in the opening credits, as opposed to whatever it was called then, you know, uh, frequent guest stars or whatever. Is is there any truth to that? Do you know if that's true? Did Abraham Lincoln say that on the internet? <laughs> if it's on the internet, it has to be true. No, I have to ask because I see these quotes attributed to, in memes attributed to Abraham Lincoln that you're like, what? No, <laughs> yeah, that is true. That's it is true. So true. your husband actually did go to, to whoever he had to go to at CBS and, and fought for him. This was the kind of person he was. And I'm not just saying that because he was mine. He really was fair. And he understood that Gilligan's Island was an ensemble. It might be called Gilligan's Island, but Gilligan would be nothing without all the other six. Right. And so he really understood that. And he could not understand, even as a kid, when I watched that show, that first season, and it would say, and the rest at the end, even as a, as a young person, maybe not a kid, but a young person, 12 years old or something, I would think, why don't they name them the way they named everybody else? Well, apparently Bob felt that way too. And he went to, for the second season, he went to um, one of the head honchos, one of the suits at CBS. And he said, um, this isn't right. It isn't fair. Dawn and Russ are equally important to the show as anybody else in the show. And so if you're going to leave them as and the rest, you're going to have to make me and the rest too. And they said, no, no, you can't be and the rest. You're Gilligan. And he said, then something's going to have to change if I have to be and the rest with them. So you're going to have to do something. And, and they were like, but we can't. And he argued the point and he said, no, he said, you have to, this is not fair. It's just wrong. And so it wasn't that big of a change, you know, at the very end of and the rest, the professor and Mary and it yeah. wasn't that big of a change and it got changed. And, um, and, and Bob was good with that. He, he ran into that kind of thing a few times. One was when TV Guide wanted him to do a cover with Ginger. And he said, I won't do it without Ginger and Marianne. And they said, well, but, you know, but Ginger's the sex. And he said, I don't, I don't care. We got two women on the show, two young, beautiful women. They both have to be on the cover. So TV got agreed and they went to the photo shoot and, you know, <laughs> if you see the cover, it's really funny because they went to the photo shoot. And of course they had, you know, Ginger on one side and Marianne on the other and they're doing the whole thing. And, and the TV guide finally comes out and Bob gets it. And there's Ginger and Gilligan on the cover. And if you look at the spine of the TV guide, yeah. you can just see Marianne's little pigtail. Oh, hanging man. over the edge he was really now i wasn't there to see this but he was really upset he was like yeah but that's what they did they just cropped her out 
and you could just see a little pigtail right there it was it was weird so if you see a copy of that guys look for that because it really it happened that way it was funny you and Don Wells, who played Marianne, uh, became lifelong friends. And uh, I know yeah. you've told me that, that a lot of the cast members stayed really tight all down mm -hmm. through the years, even yes. after the show. The one, uh, I guess, exception to that rule would be Tina Louise, who very famously wanted nothing to do with that show after it was all over. Um, yeah. What was Tina Louise like in person? Because I know you, you did stuff with her. You guys uh, went to the White House together, I think, and, and did some big award shows. What is she like as a as a person? Well, now I don't obviously know her well, but she was always so nice to me when we did the White House. Uh, we got the tour, and you know we did the Oval Office and the Rose Garden and and all of that. And she was um, she had the most beautiful skin of anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> she had the most beautiful skin, and and the reason I noticed is when we were at the White House, we were going to walk through the Rose Garden from, from the Oval Office to the West Wing. And so we all came outside and Bob had told me a story uh, from their days of filming on the back lot that Tina had asked Sherwood to find somebody to like a, a young boy or somebody, young girl, somebody to hold her parasol and to make sure that it was always covering her. And I don't think they actually did that. But Bob always talked about the fact that she had a parasol and that she stayed under it all the time. And I was like, gosh, I've never known anybody to do that. So we get to the White House. We walk out of the Oval Office. We're standing there, you know, next to the Rose Garden. And I don't know where it came from because I'd been around her. I did not see a parasol anywhere. But suddenly up with the parasol just for that brief moment in the sun, you know, and the parasol was over top of her. And I thought, that, I mean, her, you know, she had like a milk and honey complexion, you know? Right, right, right. So, um, so but I found her to be very nice when Bob passed away. She wrote me a, a letter. Um, she was nice on that trip. I was only around her maybe two other times. And the one that I can think of was, was Bob's last personal appearance where he, um, we did the, uh, oh, 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 TV Land Awards. Right. And she was there and Gilligan's Island was getting the pop culture award. And so we had a table, big round table right here. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore was getting an award. She, her table was right here. That show was getting, and then um, the Andy Griffith show was getting an award. That table was right here. And Tina wouldn't sit with us. She sat the next table over, which was the Wonder Woman table. So. That's where she sat. So I didn't really have any, you know, interchanges. And maybe there was a reason. I don't want to, you know, make it sound like she hated us or anything. Maybe there was a reason she sat there instead. But she didn't sit with us. I do know that. Mary Ann, Don Wells, and you, on the other hand, tight for 40 years. And, yeah. you know, the, the rumors were out there way before you were in the picture that she and, and, and Bob Denver had a thing on set. So what's the story? You know, I don't know. I, I, somebody, after Dawn passed away, somebody, some, some rag somewhere said <laughs> something about Bob and Dawn. And I, I honestly feel like they would have told me if there'd ever been anything between them. Bob was married when he did Gilligan. Oh, okay. All right. One thing, um, I think he might have gotten divorced. Oh, geez, the third season, or the, maybe you know there was something in there. Dawn was married briefly during that time. I just don't think there was anything. I mean, I just think Bob would have told me, and we would have laughed about it, you know. But um, but you can't stop the rumors. You know, people nowadays are they can say anything, anytime, anywhere, and if it gets passed along enough, people take it to be true. So, but I don't know anything about anything between Gilligan and Marianne. I know the fans would have liked it, I think, you know. Dream in Denver has lots of fans on her own. She's an award-winning author, several books now. The brand new one hasn't even hit stores yet, but we're doing something special today for viewers. It's called Four Bears in a Box, 
Back to the Beach. It's a great children's book, and there's lots of, of Gilligan's Island uh, touch points in there. If you pick it up uh, during this broadcast, you know, you happen to be watching online, Dream will sign a copy for you before they're even available to the public while supplies last. She's got a box of them. She'll sign them until they're gone. Go to bobdenver.com, bobdenver.com, and pick up a copy of Four Bears in a Box Back to the Beach. You spent 30 years with Bob Denver before he passed. Mm -hmm. You have told me that he was really nothing like the Gillian character that he played on TV, but what was he like? How would you describe the off-camera Bob Denver? Oh, I've, I've said this to you before, but I wish you had known him. You know, everybody in my life now, they were not in my life then. Very few people. There's maybe two or three people that uh, that I see with any regularity that, that knew him and knew us together. Right. We so, met just a few months after he passed. That's right. Yeah, we did. It, that's one yes through homer hickam and that's, right. that's when that's when you and i met and um and it makes me sad sometimes because we loved each other so much and had such a love story and i think people would um you know i wish there were people a lot of people around who remembered that but right. there aren't so um first of all ladies um bob was I'm going to say it. He was sexy and he was romantic. Get out. He was just, uh, no, he was. I know you don't think of Gilligan that way. And I get it. I get it. But he was not Gilligan. He was um, much more serious. He was highly intelligent, extremely well-read. When, when we went to the White House <clears throat> and met Bill Clinton, who was, the, who was president when we went there, uh, Bob could talk to the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, as easily as he talked to the guy working down at Lowe's, helping him pick out paint. You know, he was just that kind of person. He was just very down to earth, but highly intelligent, very well read. And he was, you know, he was romantic. He's the guy, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but he's the guy that one Christmas, I want to say it was 1995, and I wish... I could remember exactly so I could get a copy of it again, but um, he took out a full page ad in the newspaper to tell me and the world how much he loved me. What? So that was my Christmas present. It was wow. a full page, full page ad in the newspaper. Have no idea what that must have cost him, but how sweet it was. It was so sweet. I, you know, we got the newspaper that day and of course, you know, he had to open it, show it to me. I was busy cooking Christmas dinner. What did I care about the newspaper, right? So he had to show it to me, but um, but it was hilarious because it because it was Christmas morning, like my relatives who were alive and lived here then, nobody saw it. It was Christmas morning. So <laughs> like me, they were all, it was so, he thought it was going to be so spectacular that my aunts and uncles would be like, oh, it was so sweet what he did. Nobody saw it because it was Christmas morning, but I saw it and it was beautiful. It was so lovely. So that's the romantic part. He was just, you know, he just, he had a way of making me feel just, oh gosh, just so special and so valued and treasured. And I think any woman out there is going to say they, they would like that. So he was, he was pretty amazing. It, when people used to, when we first met, we would do interviews together and people would ask me, you know, what I fell in love with. I would always answer his brain because his brain was different than any brain that in my experience that I had ever known. He thought outside the box, you know, everything wasn't black and white. I, I had a very kind of black and white upbringing, you know, and he kind of encouraged me to um, look at things differently, you know, well, consider this or consider that. And it would be like, I never considered anything like that. And he's like, I know you need to do that. And I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. He was just, you know, I consider him still do my greatest teacher. Dream of Denver, our guest today on the big time talker podcast and zoom into books, her brand new award-winning children's book, four bears in a box back to the beach. 
comes out to everybody September 13th. Today, if you're watching, you can get an autographed copy at bobdenver.com, bobdenver.com, before it's even available to the general public. While supplies last, she has one box, and she's going to sign them all and send them out. Uh, we have a quick note here that uh, Christine is watching, and she says, I have to buy Back to the Beach. I have all of Dreama's other books. And you've written uh, your, your memoir uh, about your life with Bob. You wrote a great book about your pup. There's an audio book that's out now, Bob Denver in his own voice. Is, I is, know. Yeah, How Gilligan special Vader is that? Me. How cool is that? Yeah. So lots that you can take a look at at bobdenver.com. Question from Kevin in Southern California. Uh, Dreama, is it true that the city of Denver was named after Bob's great, great, great grandfather. I read this somewhere. Yes. Oh, I nobody's asked me that. So in a long time, and I'm trying to remember the story. It might have been a great, 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 great uncle, maybe. I okay. don't know why I'm thinking that, but I'm thinking that. But yes, the city of Denver was named for somebody, one of Bob's ancestors. I mean, yeah, that is true. I'm going to, okay, now that that's been asked, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, because I have that somewhere. Um, and I'm going to read it. Research and find, it. Yeah, and find out exactly what it was, because I do have that, but that is true. You know, Bob, the Denvers were originally, I was very surprised to hear this, uh, when he and I came back this way toward West Virginia, looking for a place to relocate when we left Las Vegas. Um, and talk about culture shock. That Vegas and, and West Virginia yeah, could not one. be more, more different. That's but a big uh, one. and we loved it. We loved the difference. But um Bob told me then we were going up uh is it 80 through the Shenandoah Valley? 81. Yep. 81. 81. Through, yep. through, yes, through the Shenandoah Valley. And Bob told me that the Denvers were originally from Winchester. So Winchester, Virginia, which I didn't know. I thought they you know bob was born and raised in new york so i kind of thought that's where they originated but i think they they started out in winchester so but that is a true story but it may have been a great 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 uncle all right we'll let you and research it kevin and i will find out for sure the uh the four bears in a box back to the beach the second book in your four bears book series there will yeah. probably be more um but interestingly i think it's a great story about how the whole concept or four bears actually came in part from something that your husband had given you years ago. So tell yeah. us that story, how he came up with, with sort of the original four bears concept and then how you gave it life. Okay. Well, in my book, Gilligan's dreams, my memoir, um, I write about the fact that Bob and I had, I still have obviously uh, an autistic son and the best time of our day with him was story time because he was, um, you know, aut autistic people often, uh, true of my son anyway, are not, um, you know, real affectionate, not cuddly, not all those things until story time came. And then he would cuddle with mom and curl up under my arm. And oh my gosh, I would read endlessly because that was just the best, ah, the best time for me. So uh, when I tell you I read every Dr. Seuss book in existence, tens of thousands of times. I'm not exaggerating. And so Bob, of course, Bob read too, but he would listen. And, and uh, one day he came to me and he said, honey, I think you should write a children's book. And I said, oh, so you do, do you? And he went, yep. And I've got the title. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to have to write something that kids would be interested in. I've never written a children's book. And he said, I'm telling you, I've got the title. Let me give it to you. And I'm like, okay. And his title was Four Bears in a Bag. And my answer was, what would four bears be doing in a bag? And he went, that's what you got to figure out. That was very Bob. So I said, okay. So I started writing. It was such a wonderful distraction. It took me months because we're taking care of Colin all during this. But uh, we did all the caregiving ourselves. But at any rate, um, I would take a walk with the dog and go up and down the road. You know, I was writing it in rhyme, rhyming it in my head and all that. And I got it written so he got to hear it and he liked it. But then Colin got older and a little more challenging and the bears, the story got put away. And 
forgot about it. And then Bob was diagnosed and got sick and, and Bob passed away and I didn't give it a thought until I guess it was 2018. I don't know. You're the one I got in contact with. 2018. And you found it. Like you found it in a box or a filing cabinet or something. I did. I did. It was in a manila envelope. I was spring cleaning. There it was. I took it out. I read it. I thought, this is still cute. So I'm going to send it to Burke and let Burke see what he thinks about it. And of course, you found a publisher, headline books, whom I love so much. Uh, right away, they believed in it. The only thing was we had to change it 20 years later. Uh, kids wouldn't know what a brown paper bag was. So right. we had to change it to, or they requested that I change it to a box, which actually made the story so much better. Because anybody who's ever had a child knows that they love- The box is the best part. The box, more than they love what came out of the box, you know? That's right. So when the first book came out, I'll show you the first book because there, there are two. And this one, Four Bears in a Box, leads to Back to the Beach. But when, um, when it came out, parents were sending me pictures of their kids in boxes, and they had taken paper plates and glued them on the side to look like wheels. And, you know, they've done a paper plate for a steering wheel, and the kids are posing. And, oh, my gosh, being a children's author, I have to tell you, the first book I ever wrote was Gilligan's Dreams, which was a memoir, which was a grown-up book, you know, sure. and that was moving and, and a little overwhelming in a lot of ways, writing that and going through reliving everything I had to relive to write it. But the children's book, I don't think I thought a lot about what that would feel like. But when the first book came out, I have to tell you that when a grandparent would come up and say, and buy it and say, oh, I can't wait to read this tonight with my little guy, my little granddaughter, you know, or the parents would come up and go, oh, my son is going to love this. He's three years old. It's perfect. It did something to my heart. I mean, it really did. I was like, wow, I'm putting something out into the world, something creative and imaginative that, that we all think is good. For the little guys in this world, you know, they get enough garbage, um, I think, put in front of them on a daily basis. And how lovely to feel like, you know, something that, that I wrote that came out of my head that was beautifully illustrated for them. How amazing to think that they, you know, that they, that it means that much to them. I've had so many people write and say, this is my daughter's favorite book. She asks for it over and over. Well, there's nothing much better than that. Even though I've heard people who, oh, children's book author, you can't really think of yourself as an author. But you know, that's a, a person's first introduction to reading and to uh, finding the joy in reading and the adventure in reading. And so I think children's books, yes, children's books authors, I think are very important because we're the ones who start them off. Four Bears in a Box. The brand new book is Back to the Beach. And you can get it now while supplies last. It's a special friends, family, and fans uh, offer at bobdenver.com, a signed copy from the author, Dreama Denver. Dreama, if you would, um, hold up the original sketch drawings from the first book. Oh, okay. Bob's? Yeah. Man. So... Uh, for those of you who are watching right now, so Bob actually drew the original Four Bears, and there they are. And they exist in that very first Four Bears in a Box book. That's great. He, he would be so blown away that these have seen the light of day. When I found the the script for the, for the book, the text of the book, uh, tucked between the title page and the first page of the book, uh, the little typewritten pages, were these pencil sketches that Bob did. And one night he was watching TV. He was just sketching because he thought he would illustrate the book ultimately. And so he was just sketching and he said, ah, I can look at these. And I can't believe it because those days were crazy days taking care of our son. But somehow I hung on to them. I saved them. I didn't, you know, they didn't get thrown away or, or anything. And they're so, I don't know. I just, there you go guys again. They're just so special. I think to, think that 
that was his. And I know he's up there going, I cannot believe those got published, but I love it. I think it's so special. Dream and Denver is our guest today. She's the author of the brand new Four Bears and a Box Back to the Beach and also uh, an actress, uh, a theater actress and television actress. She uh, oversees the Denver Foundation nonprofit. She helped make Country Roads one of the official state songs in the state of West Virginia. And as, uh, as somebody pretty high up in state government told me once, you are one of West Virginia's chief do-gooders. Oh, who told you that? That's very nice. So what? That, what's still? What's the next hill for you to climb? Oh what man, you excited to get up in the morning. Hmm. Um. You know, I'm. I'm not sure. I. I feel like I've. I've done. Sometimes I don't know how I could find anything as exciting as the things I've done already. Honor flight has been uh, always for honor flight has been wonderful serving and honoring our veterans. I've loved that. The Walk of Honor uh, that we started here in Princeton has been amazing, and I've loved that. The Denver Foundation, of course, is owned and operated, or Little Buddy Radio is owned and operated by the Denver Foundation, a nonprofit radio station, uh, which people have a hard time wrapping their mind around, but that's what it is. And you can um, listen, by the way, online at bobdenver.com. You can listen to Little Buddy Radio. Yes, you can. Or you can download uh, the TuneIn Radio app, uh, to your phone, open it, search Little Buddy Radio. Then you can Bluetooth the station in your car. You can listen to it anywhere. So that's pretty exciting. All this new technology, you know, when I've had the radio station for 18 plus years, which kind of boggles my mind. And um, Bob and I started together, but he oh, died. It wasn't, I don't even think it was a year old when he passed away. So it's really been my baby. And you know, I have a real emotional attachment to it. A lot of people tell me they love it musically. It's a really good station, really great. Um, it's so eclectic. You just hear, you never know what you're going to hear next. That's what people tell me. It's just always sure. a surprise what they're going to hear. So um, <clears throat> that has been wonderful and is great fun. And and everything generated by the uh, by Little Buddy Radio goes into the Denver Foundation and and of course, always for honor flight is under that umbrella. So I don't know if you come up with a great idea of the next hill I can climb, let me know because I need to keep climbing. You know what I'm saying? I love writing and I am working on the third bear book. Um, I try to think of adult theme books that, that, you know, not necessarily great big books, but something I could I could write about that people would find valuable. I don't know, maybe, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just don't know. I come up with ideas and, and I don't know. So you're, you're gonna have to come up with something. And this one, I just wanna show this because I love this little book so much. Do we see that? Zen, Zen and now. now, yes. Now this is, I'm just saying, for anybody who's ever had that once in a lifetime pet, it happens to be about a dog, but if you had a cat that was, you know, the love of your life, like this boy was the love of mine, um, it is really a gentle, loving book about the love between uh, a person or a dog and his person. And I love this little book. It poured out of me. See, that's what I need is to find something like this that just pours out of me because he had just passed away and I wanted to write and memorialize him and was able to do that. And, and uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm really excited about my four books. I really am. Whoever thought I would have four books. Wow. Pretty exciting. Really Freedom Denver will be happy to sign copies of those books. If you see her out uh, at her personal appearance sometime this year, she's at Mayberry Days at the end of September. Uh, the Southern Christmas Show is coming up. Uh, the Buckwheat Festival. Yeah. Uh, up in uh, Northern West Virginia, uh, and uh, also signing books of the Greenbrier around Christmas time in December. So she's going to be out and about with Sharpie in hand to sign copies of her four books. I am, yes, four. And, and Bob's. I also have Bob's book, uh, Gilligan Maynard and Me. But um, for the folks who love Andy Griffith and Mayberry and folks that are in this area, that I'll be there on the 22nd, the 23rd, and the 24th, which is when 
most of the um, like Tinkerbell, Margaret Carey will be there. And I found out this year, this is so much fun. I just found out that Ruta Lee is going to be there. And I have never met her. So, you know, Ruta? Tell me who Ruta Lee is. Ruta Lee. Oh, my gosh. She's, um, Griffith, uh, uh, she did a couple of episodes of the Andy Griffith Show, but she has a new book out. I, well, I don't know if I can say the name of it on here. Consider Your <clears throat> Kissed. It's the name <laughs> of the new book. And it's, it's her memoir. And she was, oh, gosh, in the 60s and probably into the 70s, she was, you know, guest starred on everything. I'm trying to think if she had like a, if anybody out there knows, you know, send a note because I'm trying to think if she had like a series of her own. If she did, I can't think of it right now. But Ruta Lee's going to be there. And then, um, oh, 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 I was going to remember his name. He co-starred with Andy and Matlock. Oh, you got lots of classic TV people at Mayberry Days. Yeah, a lot of, and uh, Margaret Carey, who was the live action model for Walt Disney for Tinkerbell. She comes every year. She is 94 years old now and nice. feisty as she can be. I follow her on Facebook and she does videos all the time. And she's awesome. So a lot of great people will be there. It is really, when you do Mayberry Days, it is like stepping back in time. I mean, there are the black and white um, police cars all over Mount Airy uh, from the 60s. I mean, it looks like, it really is like stepping back in time. It is so much fun. So Mayberry anybody Days who's in Mount Airy, North come, Carolina. Very yeah, good. I recommend Mount Airy. Come and on One down of our listeners here. says Ruta Lee was one of the brides in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad somebody remembers because I couldn't think. But she and all over television and very um, still beautiful. I mean, I uh, Harlan Bull represents her and he put up something of her the other day. She was doing um, a book signing, I want to say maybe in Palm Springs. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> does she have a Dorian Gray picture in the attic? That's what it looks like. <laughs> I mean, really, she just looked beautiful. It was amazing. So, so I get to meet her this year. That'll be fun. And folks will get an opportunity to meet you too. Dream in Denver, award-winning author of Four Bears in a Box, Back to the Beach, amongst her other books. And uh, remember, if you're watching right now, you'd like to get a special advanced autographed copy while supplies last. You can get them before they go on sale to the general public later this month at bobdenver.com, bobdenver.com. Four bears in a box, back to the beach. Dream of Denver. I love you. I love seeing you. Thanks for being here. <laughs> I always love you. Anytime I get to hang out with you, it's like one of the best days. Always a red letter day. That's Dream of Denver right there, our special guest on the Big Time Talker podcast and Zoom into Books in conjunction with our friends at Headline Books and our show sponsor, SpeakerMatch.com. Go pick up Four Bears in a Box, Back to the Beach at BobDenver.com. Thank you so much for being here. Now, go oh, ahead and make it a great day. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.